Welcome to Lingthusiasm, a podcast that's enthusiastic about linguistics. I'm Gretchen McCulloch, and I'm here with Dr. Kirby Conrad, who's a linguist at the University of Washington. But first, some announcements. The Lingcom grant is still open until June 1st, and you should apply for that if you have a linguistics communication project that you think will be helped by a bit of money and a bit of support. Uh, so there's more details for that on their website at lingcom.org. That's com with two M's as in communication, uh, and we'll link to that in the description as well. Hello, Kirby. Welcome to the podcast. Good morning. Thank you for having me. Thank you so much for, for coming. I want to start with kind of the first question that we ask all of our guests, which is how did you get interested in linguistics? So I have to preface this by saying that I didn't know I was going to major in linguistics when I went to my undergrad for, you know, my four year college. Um, I got into UC Santa Cruz. It was sort of lower on the list, but I ended up having an amazing time. But, um, when I was applying to colleges from high school, I thought I wanted to be an English major. And, uh, so I got to UC Santa Cruz and I realized, oh my gosh, you guys don't have an English major. Um, it's just not like a program that they have. And so I was like, okay, well, I'm going to make my own English major out of spare parts. And what I did was, I decided, okay, I'm going to double major in literature and linguistics, and okay. that will make an English major. And what ended up happening was I essentially made somehow the opposite of an English major, um, but I, it, I really ended up being the absolute perfect thing for me. Um, and what really cemented like, oh, linguistics is where I was going to stay for sure mm -hmm. was my first syntax class in my first year of undergrad. And the first day of class, um, my professor, Jim McCloskey, walks into the class and says, you know, and I'm a freshman, I'm a little baby at this point. Um, he walks into the class and says, this is probably the hardest class that this university offers. Please don't take it for a grade. Um, okay. <laughs> so... I have to say it was good advice. It was very hard. And um, the, the you know, taking it past fail meant that I could really focus on what I was learning. And this was a syntax one class. So syntax is all about the idea that we can make a sort of equation to put words together to produce only the real sentences of language and not the sentences that don't happen in language. And by the end of the quarter, you have a pretty good working model of what sentences can be, you know, it's not complete yet. It's always an ongoing project. And the other thing that really drew me to linguistics was that my instructors in undergrad were always really honest about this. And I try to be really honest too about this is not a solved problem. Mm. This happens constantly. Now that I'm teaching syntax one and I'm on the other side of the room, it happens constantly that students will ask me questions that the answers don't exist yet. I it's not that it's not that the answers aren't out there. It's that we haven't we haven't figured it out yet. And so this happens all the time and that as as a student to me that was really moving and exciting of feeling like I could contribute something. There's a lot that needs to be contributed. And in undergrad my instructors were very upfront about this of undergrads can and do produce new knowledge in their linguistics classes. And sometimes undergrads go to conferences, present their work, do original research. It happens because there's just a lot of unexplored space. Yeah, this was something I found really exciting as an undergrad as well. That, like, I can be looking at things and no one else has looked at this. It's really, really cool. And it's one of these things that, you know, it gives you goosebumps to be sitting in a class and realize, like, if I have an idea of how to deal with this, then I'm the first person to have this idea. Like, I don't have to just sort of go back into the literature and find, you know, so-and-so has already solved this problem. It's a matter of I can solve this problem. And so that's really, really compelling. You don't have to go through like 200 years or 500 years or a thousand years of like intellectual tradition of I need to learn this entire history before I can possibly make any sort of contribution to yeah, this area. Yeah. It's like, this is a, this is a young field and there's still stuff to mm -hmm. do that. It's feel, it feels like a math class where math isn't finished being invented. Mm. And I mean, I guess, you know, there are still mathematicians who are inventing math, but you have to have like a PhD in math before you know yeah. what, what math hasn't been done yet. Whereas very much it is the case that syntax one students will run into new math in, in terms of syntax. And so it's really cool and compelling to me. 
And this kind of gets us into the next question, which is how did you get into your current research topic? Uh, and what was the new thing that you were you were trying to figure out? So I got into my current research topic. When I got to grad school, I already knew that I wanted to study syntax. And so I was taking syntax classes. And I was also in my first year of grad school was the first year that I was out as non-binary and asking people to call me they and, and really sort of being a participant in the trans community. And most of my friends were trans. And so this was very the, the non-binary stuff and the grad school in linguistics sort of happened to me at the same time. But what this meant was I was sitting in semantics or syntax classes and reading stuff in our textbooks about pronouns that I could just say, well, that's factually wrong. That's descriptively just not what happens. And the reason that I knew this was that I was in this situation where being very newly out as non-binary and being very newly asking people to use these pronouns, it was the situation where people would use just sort of random pronouns about me. Hmm. Um, I got sort of the full spread of the, the three big ones of I, people would call me he or she or they, um, sort of at random. And the other thing is that people would switch pronouns in the middle of the conversation and not necessarily notice it. Or I would constantly be having a conversation where one speaker you know, talking about the same person, one speaker is using one set of pronouns and the other speaker is using the other set of pronouns. And so none of this is something that can be adequately described in your sort of grad school semantics or syntax textbook. What you're going to see is something like Mary likes himself marked as ungrammatical. Right. They're going to put the star on it and they're going to say, this doesn't happen. And just as a trans person and as somebody with ears, uh, I could just factually say that's not true. Because people are saying sentences like this all the time. People are saying sentences like this all the time. And so, you know, one of the things where I had this perspective that sort of previous linguists had not had. And so I was really pulled to say, I want syntax and semantics and sociolinguistics. I really want us to be able to explain this. Our theory is inadequate if we are throwing out data. And this is something where, you know, the only time I would see this mentioned would be in footnotes of like, well, that's, that's not really relevant. And so I was, you know, really pulled to say like, that is relevant. It's relevant to me every day. I can't get away from it. And so I came in knowing that I liked syntax first and being pulled towards thinking about gender and pronouns second, because it was this sort of apparently oversimplified area that left a lot of questions unanswered for me. You're like, look, I have this data and our current theory doesn't account for that. Yeah, I mean, exactly. And that's the thing that all syntacticians are doing all the time. It's why we get really rowdy when you get a bunch of them in a room is because we all feel that like excitement of like, there's something that you can't explain. You've given me an explanation that doesn't explain everything and that pull of like, I have to make sure that people know about this. And this idea that syntax should also be taking into consideration more like the variation in terms of how people use language and how different groups of people use language um, and kind of learning from sociolinguistics about addressing these types of things better. So yeah, this is something where at my graduate institution where I got my PhD, um, there is a lot of sociolinguistics. There's uh, several sociolinguistic faculty and we have a lab. And in my undergrad, we didn't have sociolinguistics as a focus. We didn't have any sociolinguistics faculty. And so it was, it was very new to me. And I was really excited by it because it feels like that, you know, yes, like here's all the complexity and and diversity that my experience as a language user tells me it's out there. And here's a way of thinking about it. And as a syntactician, I'm really interested in incorporating the stuff that people are doing socially with language, because I think if we're building, you know, our model, our algorithm of what are possible things to do, it is a little bit dishonest to be like, oh, but it if you have this certain dialect, that, that's a different thing. And we're just going to ignore that data. That that feels a little dishonest. And then the other thing is that, you know, it's not the case that anybody speaks just one exact English. Mm -hmm. Everybody has some level of variation or multilectalism or your big box of forms that you have as an option. And 
I like I, to say that people talk differently to your boss than you do to like your dog. Yeah. And if I'm building a model that's supposed to generate all the sentences, I want to generate all the sentences. And that includes ways of thinking about how you talk to your boss or your dog. Um, and for pronouns, this is so important because it does apparently seem to have like grammatical consequences. So it's not just, oh, well, we'll make the syntax part of it a little bit more vague and underspecified because there are syntactic consequences where stuff has to agree with itself. You know, if you use a pronoun in a sentence and then you're going to use another pronoun later, the rules are different than if you use a name and then use a pronoun later. So, you know, the example I gave you of like Mary likes himself where I said it sort of depends. Um, I do hear people using pronouns in this sort of way where it doesn't seem to be totally linked to the name itself. So a name is something that it really depends on who we're thinking about in our mind. So, for example, my friend Rory, who uses both he and they, mm -hmm. um, you can say Rory likes themself. Okay. And you can say Rory likes himself. Mm -hmm. um, and, like, those are both fine. And neither of them is misgendering them. Right. Because but this person uses multiple pronouns. If I'm talking about Rory, even if, like, we know that I'm talking about the same person, especially if we know that I'm talking about the same person, I can't say he likes themself. Right. Because even though this person uses these two different pronouns, that makes it sound like you're referring to two different people in the context of that one sentence. And if I sort of hold your head down and force you to say it's the same person, if I like, you know, in my example, I'm like, okay, I put the little numbers on it to say it's really, I'm really talking about Rory both times, then you're going to start saying, well, it's, it's ungrammatical. It's weird to say this. And so the rules seem to be really different for matching names and pronouns versus matching and pronouns and pronouns, which indicates to me that there is something going on in the grammar itself, in the syntax part of it. And it's not just sort of social knowledge. So it really has to be both parts of the puzzle to think about how we can explain what people are doing, but also what people don't do. Right, because even within this, like, oh, you have more options, but yeah. you have all of the possible hypothetical options. Yeah. But you could do something like switching from one sentence to the next. Is that something people do? Like, Yes. You know, so, like, they like themselves, and he's a good musician or something yes. like this. This is something where people do it about cis people, about not non-binary people, too. Um, and this is something where I noticed it in undergrad, actually. A friend of mine was telling us he had gone on a hot date last night, and we knew what kind of gender that he was dating. So it wasn't that we didn't know, like, the likely gender of who he was talking about, but he was telling us the story about this hot date using they the whole time. And saying, you know, oh, yeah, they picked me up. They were driving this beautiful car and stuff like this. And then uh, ways into the story, he started using he for a while um, while talking about getting drinks at the bar of like, oh, he bought me this beautiful cocktail. And then at the end of the story, he switched back to they of like, I don't know if I'm going to text them again. Interesting. So kind of like as this person was kind of getting more intimate in the yeah. story with this person, they're switching to a more, I guess, specific gender yeah. in this context. And then when they're saying, oh, I'm not sure if I'm going to talk to them again. Yeah, and so this is something where it's not the case that my friend's date uses two sets of pronouns necessarily, but the thing about they in particular is that it doesn't tell you anything mm -hmm. about the gender. It can imply things, but it can't specifically tell you things. So people have the option to use they pretty much all the time, and people do use it to sort of give you a little more detail and a little less detail. And when they're giving you more detail, sometimes that can give you sort of additional meaning of like, I want you to know, like, this is sort of an important part of the kind of relationship that I'm talking about. And when they give you a little bit less detail, sometimes it's like, well, it's kind of not relevant for this part. This is the part where I don't think it's important to talk about the specific gender of the person. And it's not that the gender stopped existing. It's just that we have this option of sort of turning the dial up of how much we want to include. So this kind of opportunity to switch and change pronouns in some contexts but not others is something that also sort of brought up a bunch of questions for me as a student in graduate school learning about sociolinguistics, because the other thing is that sociolinguists talk about gender, but they talk about it 
in a very binary way or mm-hmm. up until a certain point. And they're starting to really grapple with this. But reading sort of my sociolinguistics one and two papers, there's a lot of, you know, men do this and women do this. Or right. like men mostly do this and women mostly do this. No mention of non-binary people. For one thing, they did not include any in the study. For another thing, many of the authors of sort of early sociolinguistics work just didn't really have access to LGBT communities in like the 60s and 70s. Right. And so, or like it was really sort of separated from mainstream communities in a way that made it hard to compare directly. And so, you know, reading these studies as a early student of sociolinguistics and me non-binary and my first and second year of grad school sitting like, none of this applies to me. You can't explain anything I do under this model. Right. Um, and really feeling like, you know, we have to, we have to develop the theory to be able to explain everything that's happening, not just, you know, the stuff that we don't decide is weird. Right, exactly. Like, what's what's the point in having a theory if you're saying, oh, we're only going to try to explain, like, some of this data and just ignore a whole bunch yeah. that doesn't fit with the theory? Yeah. Um, and so my motivation for pursuing uh, my work in pronouns, and especially my work with non-binary and trans pronouns, has been all about answering those questions that came up for me very early in my graduate school and saying, you know, I think our way of doing this is not sophisticated enough. I really want to push us further. So what are some answers or glimmerings towards answers that you've ended up with? So one of the things that I'm trying to sort of discuss with people is that there are a bunch of other kinds of pronouns in languages besides English. And English has had these in in the past, but pronouns that encode sort of this very social information in the way that gender is and still have grammatical consequences. And we have just been not using this model to explain what's going on with gender. So things like formal versus informal you and these kinds of things? Yeah, exactly. So... One of the things that I, I've come up with is, you know, if we think of this sort of existing thing, and there's some really great research in Spanish, in the Spanish of Latin America, um, where people will switch between tu and usted and voceo. Um, so tu being the informal you and usted being a formal you. And voceo is sort of a form of the verb agreement. So the verbs will change depending on the forms. And there's some great work within the last, you know, few years about, yeah, people totally switch in the middle of the conversation. And they totally switch in the middle of the conversation as a way of accomplishing certain social goals. So this example given by Raymond 2016, where a 911 caller, he's a tourist, he's speaking Spanish, and he's calling and talking to the 911 dispatcher. And um, at the beginning of the conversation, he's trying to say, you know, I got scammed at this hotel, he's very indignant. And he's using to, to the dispatcher as a way of sort of interacting of like, you are, you are a service person in the way that you speak down to, or if you're, if you're rude, you speak down to people who are are providing you a service in certain ways. Kind of registering his anger by not being polite. Yeah. And later in the conversation, when she's starting to ask for like paperwork or receipts or stuff, and he's starting to get nervous, he switches to the usted forms. Okay. Because, and, and so Raymond conceptualizes this as the, the, the reason for this is that he now sees her as a gatekeeper to something that he wants. Right. And now he has to appease her rather than talk down to her. And so this is the sort of thing of this all happens with gender too. And it's a little bit more abstract because the social relationships that we're talking about are not sort of up or down. And, you know, you can map them onto hierarchies, but they don't cleanly fall out. But, you know, thinking about systems that refer to people's gender and especially systems that encode people's gender directly into the grammar in some way as more similar to systems that encode formality or honorific sort of marking is like a really useful model. And it's a really good way of getting away from the sort of really rigid binary models that we've looked at before. Because the idea is that if it, like honorifics, everyone knows that they, they change in a given social interaction mm-hmm. and people can switch to using a different form of you to address somebody or mm-hmm. a different form of of even I, like Japanese has all these different forms yes. of I, depending on how polite you want to be. And there's, and depending on gender and, and depending on specific like age. Yeah. There's a lot of rich sort of expressive 
content there. And basically, the idea that sort of comes out of my research is that you can use gender features, and I'm doing air quotes, gender features, where you can use like pronouns in English, but you can also use other sort of parts of speech that are more grammatical to do that work via gender marking. So what's like an example of that? I'm going to give you an example from RuPaul's Drag Race. Excellent. Um, this is very early on in the season, and a contestant is not doing well. And this is this is the contestant who is actually eliminated first. And um, have you watched you, RuPaul's Drag Race? I may have seen an episode at some point, but um, I'm not particularly familiar, so you should proceed as I know nothing. So one of the things you'll notice when you watch the show is that the contestants and the judges mostly use she for the contestants who are all drag queens, but not always. And it depends on how they feel about a particular queen. Okay. And so you'll, what you see with this, this contestant who's getting eliminated very early in the season, the lead up to her elimination is, you know, the, the usual sort of reality TV of they do confessional sort of shots where they're talking about each other. Um, and then the judges are talking shit about, you know, contestants in the way that, you know, one does on reality TV. And the, the contestant who's going to get eliminated and they set this up pretty clearly. They're, they're going to eliminate her at the end of the episode. They talk a lot about how she is struggling with the performance. She's not doing a good job with her costume construction or her, you know, deciding how to sort of do the, the performing art of drag. And when they're talking about her in her sort of way of not being a good performer, they use he. Okay. It's like, you're not performing femininity well, so we're not going to use this. It's not pronoun? exactly about not performing femininity well, because none of them talk about her not being convincing as a drag queen. Okay. They're mostly talking about her not being skilled as a drag queen. So if you okay. think about it as a type of performing art in the same way that opera or ballet or river dancing are all specific types of performing art that you can be good or bad at. Yeah. And the specific thing about drag performance is that if you are good or bad at the specific performing art, you get different pronouns. And okay. so this, this contestant was not less feminine than the other drag queens. It's that she was not good at dancing. Okay. Which okay. this is sort of conceptually a little bit further away from she's not very feminine. That was not the issue. And it was not the issue that any of the judges or other contestants were talking about. They were talking about, you know, she's not good at dancing or she's not good at organizing her time. So she has enough time in the time period to construct a good costume out of garbage or whatever the reality TV like challenge was. challenge is, you know, like the, the sort of thing of there's always a time limit. And part of the thing of succeeding at the time limit is budgeting your time. And if you're not good at that, then you're going to do poorly in the contest. And that's not really gender. It's not gender, but using he as a, as a way of sort of layering meaning on top of that. And they didn't call her he the whole episode. They did it only when they were specifically talking about her poor performance. Okay. Interesting. So it's accomplishing this very specific like sub goal. Yes. And so this is obviously sort of a very locally constrained use of that meaning, but it's very productive, meaning that people can use those meanings to accomplish a lot of different goals and they can do it without really thinking about it. They can extend the meaning and be very creative with it. And this is the sort of thing that really, to me, indicates these are up for meaning making in the same way that to and usted are up for meaning making, which is sometimes to and usted mean, you know, I'm older and more senior than you, but sometimes they mean I need something from you. Right. There's this like, there's this incredibly complicated flow chart about like when to use to versus vu in French. Yeah. Um, that's like, you know, and one of the questions is like, are you feeling lucky, punk? And if you're feeling lucky, you use to, and if you're not feeling lucky, you use vu. Yeah. You yeah. Know? And that kind of like, you know, sometimes these decisions are just sort of like micro social decisions in a particular instance where you're saying, here's, here's what I'm doing, kind of. So yeah, so essentially my contribution here is saying that that flowchart of are you feeling like a punk and a lot of micro social decisions applies just as well to gender as it applies to formal pronouns. And what this does is it means that we can conceptualize pronouns as more similar cross linguistically rather than more different. And this is a hard project because it, it doesn't look like 
pronouns are a natural class, meaning that they're not made out of the same stuff in every language. But languages generally need pronouns as a way to avoid saying the same name over and over again. And what this ends up doing is encoding social information to varying degrees. Because there are lots of languages that don't have gender in pronouns at all. The or... majority of the world's languages have no gender marking on their pronouns. Right. So, you know, the he, she thing in English, we're in a minority position here. And, it, you and know, it's sort of this weird artificial thing of like Indo-European languages often have gender pronouns. But outside of Europe, it's and I mean, very you know, just do. if you're going to only compare cousins and then say that you found a fact about all humans, you have a pretty serious confound there in that they are related. It and turns so, out all humans have red hair. Yeah, because I looked at all the Weasleys and they all have red hair. And so all humans have red hair. It's just it's nonsensical to do that kind of comparison and only look at Indo-European languages because because they are related. And so you are going to get some factors that there's no reason to assume that's universal. And you've done like surveys of, you know, how English speakers use pronouns has been changing like demo- demographically as well. Like by Yes. Age. So when I've been doing these um, surveys, my, my sort of biggest survey was looking at singular they. Mm-hmm. So singular they has been in English for hundreds of years. There's lots of work on this. Um, it's in Shakespeare, it's in it's, Chaucer, all yeah, of this stuff. You know, it's it's been around, but the kind of singular they that's been around is not the kind that I use as a non-binary person. So the different kinds of singular they are something like, okay, uh, someone forgot their backpack. Right. And so we don't know who's, whose backpack it is. Yeah. Um, or uh, each linguist should grab their name tag. Um, I think the example from, from Shakespeare is... There's not a man I meet, but does salute me as if I were their well-acquainted friend. Yeah. Um, and here you, you kind of, it's interesting because you kind of have man there. Yeah. But he's clearly using this man in a somewhat generic sense and using the, the they there rather than there's not a man I meet, but does salute me as if I were his well-acquainted friend, which would be more this like specific men. So this is interesting because you'll also see sentences like pregnant women should always be given their parental leave. And we're definitely talking about women. So it's not the case that it's just like, oh, well, Shakespeare thinks that man is the default kind of person. And so no, it's also the case that you'll see that kind of generic singular they with woman. But the thing is that we're talking about a set of people, right? We're talking about a bunch of people in a group and then saying each one does their thing which is different than talking about a specific person. So the new use is something like Kirby forgot their backpack. So I'm a singular they user, meaning that I uh, don't want to be referred to by he or she or anything else. Uh, I want to be referred to by they. And it is also the case that this can happen whether or not we're talking about someone who prefers that, using they about a particular person is syntactically different than using they about a group of people that is sort of singular because I'm talking about each one individually, right? So each student forgot their backpack is different than Kirby forgot their backpack. Kirby is a specific person. Right, and we can point to that person. Like Each person forgot their backpack is, if I'm pointing to each person, I have to do a bunch of different pointing. Yes, So when I did my big survey, what I found was that use of the specific one, and I tested it by using names, and I actually tested it using a bunch of different gendered names, um, and I compared it with other pronouns as well. So I did masculine and feminine and gender neutral names with they, singular, and he and she to just see if there's a difference. Yeah, for sure. And what I found was that there is a difference, but not for everybody. Okay. So... Older speakers do find it a little bit less natural sounding when I use a name and singular they. Mm -hmm. It's different than when I use a name and he or she. Younger speakers and like the, the sort of age cutoff is like around 35. Okay. So basically like millennials on down. Younger speakers really don't have a problem with it. In mass, most of them find it fine and they'll rate it as this is just a normal sentence. And, you know, obviously there are individual people who are like, no, that sounds weird to me, but it's not as many. And when you sort of chart it all out, it really looks like there's a sort of slope that as you look at older people, they have a harder time accepting that as part of the grammar or part of their unconscious 
syntax. And is this a thing that like some older people are managing to do it? It depends on like how many queer friends they have, or is it like a? Yeah. So the studies on this are very new, and to sort of triangulate across um, my research and some of Lauren Ackerman's and some of Evan Bradley's, um, it looks like in general. If you have more non-binary friends, then you're better with singular they. So that makes sense. So that's Lauren Ackerman's study. And mm-hmm. in general, if you are trans or non-binary yourself, you're better with singular they. And so binary trans men and women are in general better with singular they than okay. cis people in general. And non-binary people are sort of obviously fine with it. Like, oh, look, I do this myself, so I guess I'm going to yeah. practice it a lot or, yeah. or whatever. Um, and then the other thing that influences it, and so I'm talking about three different studies. We haven't sort of combined forces yet. This mm-hmm. is all stuff that's been published within the last two years. It's very, very fresh off the process. It's cutting edge linguistic research. It's extremely cutting edge. Yeah. So Lauren Ackerman's stuff is saying, you know, if you have more non-binary friends, you're better with singular they. I can say, okay, if you're younger and or trans and or non-binary yourself, you're better with singular they. And then Evan Bradley has been looking at um, sort of people's feelings about prescriptivism and feelings about gender ideology. And so people who have more sort of prescriptive opinions in general are worse with singular they. And then also people who have, um, this is what he calls benevolent sexism, which is not, oh, I hate women. And it's like, I'm, I'm going to open the them. door for all the women. But yeah, so benevolent sexism is is sort of, I think that people of different sexes have fundamental differences and different needs based on their sex. And so if you have that like benevolent sexism, you're more likely to be worse at singular they. And it's related to this idea that there are binary sort of baseline categories of people. I found for me that like acquiring singular they, which I feel like I've done in the past couple of years, because yeah. I, you know, I know more non-binary and agender people who, who use singular they as a pronoun. And at first it took kind of a conscious thought, which is kind of like acquiring a language, but in an easier sort of way. Like I also have yes. to do this sort of conscious thought when I'm speaking French and I'm figuring out, am I using tu or vu or like, am I, am I doing this, this thing in French? And it takes a bit of extra thought. But it doesn't mean that adults can't acquire a language because adults clearly do learn languages. Yes. Uh, and this is not learning an entire language. It's it's doing something like that. But I think I had to believe that it was worth doing this additional bit of conscious effort in order to actually do it. Yes. So all the singular they researchers kind of agree that the next step is figuring out what is the factor that makes it easier for some people to learn it and not for other people. So, you know, you're not the first person that I've talked to who has said like, yeah, I've kind of learned it in the past couple of years, or I've made an effort to learn it. And I also have people who have said, you know, I just kind of picked it up from around me, but as an adult, mm-hmm. not something where, you know, you know, the, the, the Zoomers, the very young Gen Z, people who are coming into my freshman classes with singular they already, they're acquiring it as children. They don't have to do any work. They already have it. But it is the case that some adults seem to be able to acquire it on purpose and some adults seem to want to acquire it, but really can't. Hmm. Or they report significant difficulty. So, you know, you will get people and it doesn't seem to be correlated with age. And so we need to do studies about this. We haven't done it yet because we all you know, need some resources to be able to do that. But there are people who say, you know, I'm really trying to learn singular they, but I mess up often. Mm. Um, well, people will frequently underreport how much they mess up. So you will frequently say, if you, if you look at somebody who is saying, I'm trying to do better, but I, I do make mistakes, they'll usually say, yeah, I make one or two mistakes. And then you'll actually look at what they've said and they mess up almost constantly. Mm. And so we don't really know yet what the issue is that makes it easier for some people to learn it. Or something Um, like kind of like intimacy. Yeah. Like I notice this on the internet, especially because you don't have as as many cues on the internet. And oftentimes if you're like referring to a commenter above you in a thread and all you know is that the commenter's initials are like JD or something, you really have no information about this commenter. People will often use they to refer to the previous commenter. Yeah. Um, Whereas if somebody knows me, one of the ways that I can tell that they know me is that they're actually using she, her for me as opposed to using the sort of generic they of the comment thread. Yes. Um, so it's maybe signals a kind of intimacy. Yes. So um, this is something that Leah Velman has talked about, and I, I cite her in my dissertation because it's a great idea. Something called distal they, where it's a use of singular they that ends up implying social distance. 
And essentially what you explained of like, well, if they knew me, they would be using a more specific form. And it's in the same way that like using someone's name and especially first name implies familiarity. Mm -hmm. And it's not necessarily that a first name has some sort of grammatical feature of familiarity. It's just that it implies that you have enough social contact to know their first name and also they're not going to get mad at you for using it and this sort of thing. So um, that, that sort of way of using they to mark social distance or social closeness, if you have an option of a more specific pronoun, is something that sort of falls out of like how specific and how much information am I giving you about this person's social position. And I assume if it were relevant, or if you had more information, you would be giving me more information. And if you had less information, that might be why you're using this sort of underspecified, like vague form. So we've kind of talked about people acquiring singular they very consciously and like putting in this effort to sort of do that. Did you also study why people are putting in this sort of effort to reorganize their syntax? Like people don't do this all the time. So I'm going to do a a rude thing to you. You told me that this is something that you have learned on purpose. You made an effort to learn it. Why did you do that? I mean, it seemed like the polite thing to do, the like being a considerate human thing to do. Like if someone says, please call me this, then I either need to do that or I need to accept this person's going to like me anymore. Yeah. So that's the motivation. As far as I can tell you, and I haven't yet gotten into the formal research, but it seems like people sort of volunteer the information to me pretty frequently that the reason somebody would decide to change their grammar on purpose is to avoid doing this thing that's baked into their grammar that ends up being very rude. So misgendering somebody is very rude. Uh, it is rude whether you do it to a trans person or a cis person. It just so happens that it happens to trans people a lot more often. So you're asking me why are people acquiring this? And the answer that you have given me yourself is, I don't want to misgender people. It's rude. Um, it's rude to call somebody by the wrong name. Yeah. It's rude to just decide to give somebody a name that they don't identify with. You know, uh, I think that a lot of people can say, if you just like come up to me and say, hey, I'm going to call you champ. Maybe I don't want you to call me champ, actually. Maybe I don't like to be called champ. And so, you know, people really don't like that feeling of being called something that doesn't reflect what you think you are. And so if you know any non-binary people, you have this motivation to not misgender them. So a really sweet story that I can share. When my friend changed their pronouns to they, one of the things that they're cis friends did was they decided, okay, we're going to hang out. They all lived together. They were all roommates. We're going to hang out today. We're going to all clean the house and we're going to talk about them all day and tell stories about them to practice and to practice where they don't have to hear us mess up. Oh, nice. So the, the friend wasn't there. Yeah. It was just like all of their yeah. cis friends saying like, we're going to practice. Yeah. So this, this friend, um, you know, it came back, like, you know, came over the next week and everybody was already perfect at it because they had dedicated like an eight hour day of just doing that and correcting each other mm. um, and and getting the practice out of the way before um, it's going to hurt somebody's feelings. And so that practice phase is something that's really useful. You know, asking a bunch of friends to like spend eight hours cleaning is something that not everybody has time to do. But the other thing that you can do is something like uh, tell a story about the person and encourage yourself to like practice self-correcting because it's in this way where you're doing it in not in front of them. Right. And so you can get all your mistakes out of your system, not in front of them. And you're not asking the person to do the sort of emotional labor of correcting you every time you're just doing it out of the way. And so they don't have to be on your case. The sort of social awkwardness of like, oh, do I speak up and then make this conversation about that? Or do I, you know, let it slide, but then maybe they'll keep doing it. And this is something that's hurtful. Yeah. You can do that work without burdening the person. Cause like, okay, for my example, if I spent as much time in the beginning of my sort of transition and grad school at the same time, I spent a lot of time correcting people and sending emails and really insisting. And it took up a lot of time. And I had to do do a whole bunch of other stuff. Yeah. Also, I was in grad school. I was very busy. Um, And, you know, I had to do this with everybody. So, you know, if people took it upon themselves to get good at it on their own, that was one fewer of my like friends and family that I had to worry about tutoring. Right. You know, 
So, you know, my sister just did it on her own and practiced and doesn't mess up in front of me and it's fine. And it means that I never have to like put my mental time and budget for correcting. I think there are a lot of tips that, you know, people can have of like, oh, this does seem like a thing that I want to do of like, I do want to respect people and I do want to, you know, not hurt people. But here are the kind of individual pieces of that. Uh, and you're putting together a guide. So it's not just me. I am absolutely indebted to the work of Bronwyn Bjorkman and Lex Connolly, um, who put together the They 2019 conference, which was a linguistics conference and was focused completely on non-binary and trans pronoun use. And one of the outputs of this conference is that everybody who attends is collaborating on materials and ways that we're going to share our research findings for people to use in their real lives. And so we are putting together brochures of like, how do you practice? How do you learn? How can you help people? And these are something that we're, we're trying to make very accessible and trying to make it very straightforward and shame free free and all about allowing people to decide what they want to accomplish with their grammar. Because, mm -hmm. you know, deciding to acquire a grammatical feature on purpose is making the decision that you're going to rewrite something totally unconscious as a way to stop hurting people. And that takes work. But like, even making the decision in the first place is really important. For more Lingthusiasm and links to all the things mentioned in this episode, go to Lingthusiasm.com. You can listen to us on iTunes, Google Play Music, SoundCloud, or wherever else you get your podcasts, and you can follow at Lingthusiasm on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and Tumblr. You can get IPA scarves and other Lingthusiasm merch at Lingthusiasm.com slash merch. Lauren tweets and blogs as Superlinguo. I can be found as at Gretchen A. Mixie on Twitter, and my blog is allthingslinguistic.com, and my book is Because Internet. You can follow Kirby Conrad, our guest, on Twitter as at Kirby Conrad. To listen to bonus episodes and help keep the show ad-free, go to patreon.com slash lingthusiasm or follow the links from our website. Current bonus topics include teaching, advice for linguistics, and a very special episode of Lingthusiasm written by robots. Can't afford to pledge? That's okay, too. We also really appreciate if you can recommend Lingthusiasm to anyone who needs a little more linguistics in their life. Lingthusiasm is created and produced by Gretchen McCulloch and Lauren Gaughan. Our senior producer is Claire Gaughan, and our editorial producer is Sarah Dapirella. And our music is by The Triangles. And I will leave you with our guest. Stay Lingthusiastic. <laughs>